Good afternoon, panel for Recording Heritage. I'm uh, Robert Castells. I'm from the National University of Singapore. So the difference is that our casual dress is tucked in. <laughs> <laughs> Jokes apart. <laughs> I'm very pleased and honored to uh, introduce uh, Nicole Ravel. I've known Nicole Ravel for a number of years. Her uh, writings are are very competent, uh, which you expect for a person who is such a distinguished uh, ethnomusicologist, anthropologist, ethnobiologist, and linguistic. Uh, read again this very nice booklet done by Andrea for the conference. And this is only a, a partly of everything what uh, Nicole has achieved. CNRS, Musée National d'Histoire Naturelle de Paris, uh, uh, Sorbonne, Nanterre, etc., etc. Nicole has uh, uh, researched uh, and published uh, extensively over a long period of years um, the Palawan Islands, that is in the west of the Philippines, and the Provence uh, in France, the, ep the epic poetry. And so if you are educated in, uh, in France or in the French realm, you would notice the irony of uh, Provence versus Paris and the Palawan versus Manila. Okay, Madame, s'il vous plaît. <laughs> Nicole. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to NTU and to Andrea and uh, all your colleagues here in this uh, section of the university. Uh, I shall address to your audience as a linguist anthropologist. I'm not an ethnomusicologist. I work with and deeply, but I'm not competent on that realm as I wish I, would, I could be. And I have worked on oral knowledge and oral tradition of the western part of the Austronesian world, more particularly in the Philippines, which is your neighboring country here in Singapore. Literature, literature of the voice is the word I have fought and chosen 20 years ago to designate artistic expressions uh, by way of long chanted or sung narratives, namely epics and ballads. And uh, the work we have done on intangible heritage and the rising of digital technology is relevant to the DIHA uh, program here in this university, namely Digital Intangible Heritage of, in Asia. As I conceive, as early as 87, 1987, I conceived the way to make an archive of epic poetry because I was confronted to it on the field. I'm a field worker. And uh, I follow up, since that time, the development of technology and progressively adjust my publication of Literature of the Voice to what was a flexible <laughs> disc in 83, another uh, 45 uh, minutes uh, in a CD, and then a CD-ROM, and then a DVD-ROM, and finally web which is the most relevant tool for this, kind, this genre, which combines music, performance, uh, within a given context, it's going to vary, and poetry. So uh, this multimedia uh, progressing in such a speeding pace uh, force us to adjust all the time to new ways and to explore, to explore and create 
it's a new way to write, I would say. It's not a linear writing, it's an architectonical writing with a very bare rhetorics. You have to be very, very straight to the point. You cannot make elucubration, you cannot make uh, complex uh, formula. You have, to, you have to be very clear. And in this respect, it's where complexity is always to be counterbalanced by clarity and simplicity. And this is what uh, Edgar Morin, a French uh, sociologist, who has uh, developed a theory on complexity since the 60s, is now 93 years old, still alive, and has always has, has shown us in, in, in his experimentation of complexity the necessity to to deal also with simplicity in the way we present data. Uh, so we have always to improve our method, and I have been experiencing it in my life since 1991, when I start a big program I'm going to talk about. Uh, technology, we have to, to adjust to these new tools in order to improve our methods of saving, which is an old attitude, presenting in a modern way, different way, and analyzing with different tools what music and literature of the voice provided with, provide us with. Uh, so, uh, The various lenses we have to use are very complex. And this needs the complexity of transdisciplinarity. Uh, I have to speak like a university professor. I wish I could be more light today, but I, I have to deal with this difficulty of combining uh, interactive media conceptor, cap uh, computer engineers, museum curators, to build multimedia archive accessible to the web. And uh, for this, we have to use multidisciplinary approach on the field too. And if you don't have a, a preview of what you want to do as a website, then you cannot use the proper, you cannot uh, collect on the field what is necessary for your prospect. So all this is a long uh, thought conceived of plan that you set in motion with others. And uh, uh, well, then uh, the new era of digital humanities, DH, is, uh, and the related, uh, related transforming relationship to knowledge, are emerging nowadays as the archives of song, text, and video are becoming a reality on the cyberspace, detached from the physical space, although it's still there, a digital multifaceted space and new memory is alive and offered to our exploration, creativity, and appropriation. So uh, I will start now with uh, the experience I had. I will present successively three archives. Uh, And these are the sites where you can consult them. Uh, during the 90s, from 91 to 201, I was in charge of conducting an international seminar on epics within the integral study of Silk Road, Roads of Dialogue. It was an international program under the Hospices of UNESCO, and it was uh, part of the program on uh, the decade for cultural development. 
uh, I was uh, asked to do this, although I didn't work in Central Asia, but because of my vision of what could be a modern archive for the future at that time. I was able to expand efforts to document and safeguard this multifaceted intangible heritage. And uh, uh, in the country where I am more competent as a linguist, and we, where we have uh, 170 languages plus the dialects, and uh, namely, as I said a while ago, the Philippines, and the collection began from my former experience since the 70s among the Palawan, which were forest people, hunters with the blue pipe, extremely uh, uh, scattered habitat. We shall present their landscape uh, in two weeks from now, and uh, or one week, and uh, we we were we were following them in their inclination, in their creativity. These are auditive people. They are not visual at all. They, are, they have a fan fabulous way to mimic all the birds they listen to. We have work with Robert on that in a different way. Him as a composer, me as a collector and an analyst also, thanks to the coordination with an ethnomusicologist, uh, Dr. Maceda, in the Philippines, who was also a composer and the founder of ethnomusicology in Southeast Asia. And uh, we uh, discovered uh, that we, we had to follow their inclination. And so, as I went to the opera when I was four, I was very inclined to, to listen to them and to follow them. So it was a predetermined uh, fact of hazard and chance that uh, I did not master, but I could master in the way that I could collect, I think, properly what they were singing. And uh, by the way, an epic among them can last seven nights. Huh? Not, success, not continuous, but seven broken nights. Uh, complete nights from seven to sunrise, seven o'clock in the night to sunrise, which when it's transcribed represents 110 pages because there is the slow uh, speech deliver, song delivery of the narrative, but the plot is being perfectly built up within one night. And um, so this, this commanded my, my, for, my next step, which was to organize a collection of epic all along this immense landscape, but I delegate to others. But the implementation of the vision is mine on the Philippines. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, We have been gathering during uh, the last 24 years. We have been work, uh, working with 69 singer of tales, 15 languages, 25 scholar and local knowledgeable persons, and 11 technicians. This is the copyright of this archive hmm? with their name and their ethnic group and their agreement to have been put on the web. Uh, so uh, it is now in Ateneo de Manila University. It is uh, thanks to the vision of the president who asked me to build up a website out of the physical archive I was bringing in every year since 91 uh, documents because I could give 39 or 40 grants from the French government to Filipino people. All this is an enormous uh, machine that you have to set into motion, and I was backed up by their support. Uh, then he asked me to do it with the aim of education and diffusion within the country and abroad of the heritage of this 
ethnic groups who are most of the time ignored by the capital, huh? totally ignored most of the time. Some are animist, other are animist Islamized, other are animist Christianized. But when you see uh, the impact of Christianization, there was a gliding effect of, of epic singing to passion singing, passion of Jesus Christ. So we have taped that also. Uh, uh, so uh, I will go uh, now to enter to this uh, site. I, I, I do it on PowerPoint. And if we have time, we will connect to have the sound um, on the internet. But I cannot manipulate the internet and talk to you <coughs> quickly. I cannot. Uh, so here you have, uh, I'm going to present the, 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 the architecture of this site. It is uh, 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 an overview that, well, it's explained. Oh, it's not the same thing I have. Oh, yeah, I understand. <laughs> it, you have an, uh, a comment on top of what is being presented. This is an overview that lasts something like five to six minutes and uh, about epic poetry in this area. And then you have the listing of the, the boxes in which you have a local treasure hmm, in the given language. There are now 15, but I have had last year 16, another box. It's not yet online. Uh, the next is what are the tasks that we have in each box? One is map, mapping of the area, then an overview, then the archive list of this uh, group, precise group, then the very epics themselves, transcribed and translated, then the articles related to this epic that contextualize, then photos that contextualize in a visual way with captions, and then video that show us the way the performer is singing, interpreting. But when you are among hunters with blowpipe and no electricity, you are reduced in your videos. And now we have better tools to have uh, uh, solar uh, equipment. But uh, in the time I was doing it, there was none. And we were still working with cassettes. Huh? All this has been digitized, of course. So. Uh, we have thought to reflect the poetics of each group, each song, through the layout on the page. It's a projection of time on space. And we have uh, tried to capture by ear the rules of composition that was necessary to establish the first manuscript. And this is where ethnomusicology comes in beyond phonology to transcribe, orthography as close as possible to phonology, and uh, then pragmatics, of course, then ethnomusicology, and then acoustics will come in. And finally, ethnology, which is first. <laughs> I mentioned it last because I related it to also to cognitive anthropology, because we are here facing a fabulous uh, moment in history of mankind still alive today, which represent a pre-Homeric uh, situation. And we are saving it with the modern tools. So it is uh, quite fascinating as an experience. And uh, it gave me the strength to, to continue. So. Um, According to the, poe the, the, the poetics of each group, you have to find a way to project on the page and establish the first manuscript. In a way, you fix the butterfly, because when you are a context of orality, each performance is a unique one. And each performance has the interest of being unique. <laughs> so uh, I have taped two epics with uh, 
twice the same epic with 25 years difference in time and the same single of tail. And I could measure uh, lex lexicometrically uh, the, the les écarts différentiel, uh, the, the way they, they, he continues or he split from when he performed. So uh, these are details which are, I think, full of interest. But I would like to go faster now to the very uh, presentation of one box only. As we spoke yesterday, we heard uh, some presentation on the Orang Laut. Orang Laut are sea nomad, and we have sea nomad in the Philippines, in the Sulu archipelago, as well as in, uh, as you have in, in, in Indonesia and in the Malacca Strait also. So uh, it is very, that's why I choose that archive. Islamized people, this is their location, and the arrows shows where I have tape, and we have tape with the local people, uh, several epics. To move there is not in easy, and it's not possible nowadays. I was uh, in boat with four Armalites around me. Huh? It's not easy. But uh, this is the first overview of the culture in four or five minutes. So it's a movie. And then we have the listing of the epics that we have gathered there. And uh, this is the protocol of each file as in an archive uh, set, set up. And then these are the boxes that we have gathered, namely 15 epics or ballads. And um, when you have, uh, as here, a separation, the man on the same page because the poetic composition in seven feet for a meter, a meter of seven heptasyllabic allows you to have face to face the manuscript. So uh, the, this is a, an edition of on, on printed uh, on paper and it's now 36, uh, 36 volume binding uh, 7,820 pages. Mm -hmm. But of course, it's because I've worked in collaboration and I have followed up the building of the manuscript that this is possible. This is an example of one singer of Tell in the Sulu. This is a book I published. It's called the uh, Silungan Baltapa, The Voyage to Heaven of a Sama Hero. And it's a, a shamanic voyage. Uh, split into the mirage uh, reference to Islam. I have done this manuscript with all the people who have worked in Sulu since the 50s. A Belgian a priest who has become a f fundamental uh, an anthropologist who passed away last year. An American scholar who Harlow Nemo, Jerry Rickson was the first, Harlow Nemo, the second in the 60s. Alain Martineau was the next. This is the French and the English translation. This shows you a manuscript with a face-to-face, -face, mirror-like presentation. And uh, this, so, Martineau was the next one in the 70s. And I was the next in the 90s, 96. Martineau went back in 95, and, and uh, I follow 96, 97, 98. After that, Sipadan, kidnapping, no more, 2000. But we continue to work by internet, of course. And so it was possible to print that book, which I didn't bring. It has a DVD-ROM inside. But as it was said, DVD-ROM are destroyed or almost destroyed. So that's why the web could be of help if it is not destroyed by other wills <laughs> or choices. 
Then you have, for each box, a series of papers written during that time by the concerned people or competent people. Then you have the layout. All is in PDF. You can print it on your desk. Then you have the photos, collection by theme, by craft, by landscape, by with captions. And this is a caption of one. Um, then you have the videos, and we have three. OK, this is very silent. But if I am on the web, I can have it sounding all the time. Hmm? It's simultaneous and complete. Then the final archive is the total listing, and now we are more than, it's more advanced than that. Then each box presents you its uh, various modalities of, because some people have one epic or two, or I was able only to take one or two, other 15, other it's unequal. Of course, reality is different. So, uh, may I know how much time I have left? <laughs> because, <laughs> yes. So, um, this year, Oral Tradition, which is a very famous journal created by John Millis Foley in America, he passed away also. And in his memory, we have built up an, a special issue that is called Oral Tradition 28.2, where you have a series of archives in the world. And uh, uh, this uh, issue has uh, presented several e-companions to my, it is in my, uh, my, my presentation of it as an e-companion where I have synchronized by uh, listening and by putting markers, the sound, the words, and the translation in two languages, but they have present only the English. This was on a CD-ROM in 2000. It's over now, but it was retrieved in this uh, compilation by um, the technician of oral tradition, Mark Jarvis, who is a ro remarkable technician. So uh, it's, I think the best is for you to do like uh, Mr. Masuhito has done last night. He has already looked at the archive, so I, uh, I keep on hoping that you will just, it's free of access. You just have to register your name and your institution and, and, and have your password, and don't forget it if you want to go back. But I would have to say something before I close that matter, is that it was conceived for education, not yet at that time in the 200 uh, or nine when I build it up and we launch it in 2011, it, 200, 2011, it was conceived for education, not for crisscross research or lexicometric uh, uh, analysis. So this will need an, another, uh, an addendum of uh, software to, to be able to work comparatively or to hunt for words. And this is where I will need the help of other engineers. Um, I would like now to present you another archive which is in Paris and which is the, the, the old archive of the CNRS Musée de l'Homme. It started in 1930 with the great expedition sur uh, Dakar, Djibouti, organized by Griol. And uh, it, has, uh, it was resting, shelter, at the uh, Musée de l'Homme. Then the Musée de l'Homme has been moved to, the objects have been moved to Musée du Quai Branly, but the archive of music has been moved to, not the instrument, the sound archive, to Nanterre. And this is the audio database of ethnomusicology 
and you have here, the places where records have been made on the field. And uh, I would like to go quickly on this, the history of this uh, gathering, of this collection of uh, authentic documents made by ethnomusicologists or anthropologists or linguists and deposit there. My collection is there too and uh, my collection in music and in sung poetry also, but all that is music because the other archive focus only on epic and ballads. So um, the museum collection were later renamed, of course there were 78 record, uh, uh, all type of, of uh, all the various progressive uh, uh, support of uh, the sound, and uh, Gilbert Rouget, who is still alive, continued the work of Schaeffer, and then we have now all this point on the map that I show you today. Uh, 37 CD, CD ROM were published. I have one of them on Palawan music, done with Professor Maceda. And uh, uh, we have uh, World Voices, Music Instruments of the World, a collection that, is, that should be duplicated or should be reprinted by, published by CNRS Musée de l'Homme uh, between 88 and 2001. Then we have, they have moved, as I said, to Nanterre and it became the Research Center for Ethnomusicology, CREM. Ce n'est pas la crème de la crème, mais c'est crème. <laughs> so, this is the recent history since 68. Uh, and you have some data that are, the importance is that it is also saved at the National Library of France and also in the CNRS. Uh, so, uh, like an herbarium, you need to save in three places. You have to make three samples of a flower collected. Here you have to save at least in three, three copies. Um, and then uh, the concern uh, with uh, the nowadays trends is uh, a collaborative computer platform for the production of knowledge and its dissemination. When I mean collaborative, is at an international level, European level and international level. So uh, the European, uh, I, I mean, this is an, an illustration of what it is. I just want to develop first what is Europeana sound. It is uh, based in London in the British Library and uh, it is uh, already connecting 2,200 libraries, museum, archives, and audiovisual in European collections. It is the jukebox of Europe, and uh, it is in 29 languages, and accessible, of course, books, 30 million books, films, and Europe sound and musical heritage ranging from classic to folk music to environmental sounds of the natural world as well as oral histories. So uh, this collection reflects the numerous cultures, history, languages, and creativity of the people of Europe or analyzed by Europeans abroad over the past 130 years. So it's a very precious uh, immense convergence, convergence of uh, data that uh, should be known to you. And the online availability through the scientifically managed non-profit database of the CNRS Musée de l'Homme Sound Archive is a form of return to the communities of their own cultural heritage. 
And uh, this uh, needs also to take into consideration in ethnomusicology or in anthropology the problem of the will or the, the non-agreement of the people to put it on the web. So uh, we have to have an ethics in, this, in dealing with this matter which is not uh, at random. It has to be each time a, select, a, a decision taken and respected according to the will of the people. So property right and the implicit ethics uh, of the online diffusion of music archive is to be taken into consideration and is taken into consideration. So the European sound model uh, I have given you formally the, the website, is, uh, as I said, uh, a, a wonderful expanding tool. Huh? It's, a, it's going to grow still. It's not finished there, 2,200 libraries and so on. It's going to expand. But it started recently. And uh, uh, I like to talk about the Telemeta platform. Uh, the platform architecture organizes, catalogs, and displays this archive on the web server. And Telemeta is a collaborative platform of digital sound with the joint collaboration of, in Paris, of engineers from the CREM, the lute making acoustics and music LAM laboratory of the CNRS web developers from Paris Sound Company. So they work together for seven years on the content management system, leading to the implementation of the Telemeta architecture to support the audio archive database. This platform written in Python and JavaScript languages is open source software that allows the management of large audio database and easy indexing of sound files. So this is a, a, a sound, a, no, this is a sound file. I'm going to show you a different one with, it's an illustration that is on the side that I had to put after. <laughs> see, it's the continuation of the file, okay? And then you have by collection. This is uh, Dana Rapoport, who has done a magnificent work in Sulawesi among the Toraja. Now she's working on Flores. She conducted with me several years a seminar on performing arts. And uh, there is a, the old collection of Mireille Elfer, the wife of the pianist, uh, who has work in Tibet. And this is an example of the wave spectral, fo the waveform spectral of the Gez one of the voice of the Gezar epic. Uh, this is acoustics that is included in this. So this is research in acoustics that is operating. This is the continuation of the file. And uh, I speed up because I have to. This is an excerpt, excerpt of the so-called very inaccurately, Beijing, Beijing Opera, uh, 1962, uh, gathered by Le Prince de Bonaparte. So it's interesting. It's an old, old uh, performance. And then my collection, we are going to work when I come back to finalize the whole indexing of my files on this Telemeta system. Uh, this is a uh, spectral analysis of a Palawan lullaby. I have done uh, interesting spectral analysis of the voices of a shaman. It's not there. Then uh, the, we go from small to medium and now to big. Uh, the Secteur Audiovisuel, Département Audiovisuel de la Nouvelle Bibliothèque Nationale is de France is uh, doing an enormous work of gathering all this collection that we have. And the, the private, many scholars st still have this in their home, you know, 
and it needs to be digitized. So everyone is contributing. And this is uh, the data, the, I mean, the, the, I present here one file only of, uh, but I will go to it later on. <laughs> Let me tell you something first. If I have a little time, okay. So uh, Pascal Corderex is the curator of the sound collection, and he wrote, and it's on the web, uh, papers about the historical development. At the turn of the 20th century, we were following the archive of Berlin and Vienna. In the 60s, there was the Principle of Paris a conference on library, and the main principle were decided upon. With the international standard description, the both files are normalized in 71. America has its own uh, cataloging system, AAC. Machine readable catalog mark information is being structured so that computer can understand it, beginning. In the 80s, Wikipedia, Google starts and archive. Extendable markup languages, XML, starts too. The encoded archival description, EDA, is an example. And the, for instance, the conference, uh, l'exposition universelle de 1931 in Paris is recorded there and analyzed. So general presentation of the collection, its history, its content, documents, indexation, and then you enter from one to the other, then you go to the gamelan that was performed on that place of Bali. So uh, this was an important moment for creativity in France. Jolivet, uh, Arthur, Antonarto uh, were influenced by this moment of hearing, you see. So uh, around 2000, a new model is developing, and it's the model of entities, relationships. And we pass from arborescence to rhizome, to, to, to relationship, interconnection, and it's the new trends. So uh, that what is needed as a synthesis? In order to be visible on the web, it is necessary to be able to be indexized by search engine, to be linked to existing data, and to be easily accessible by the user. Diffusion and user's accessibility, mass user accessibility is taken into consideration. So uh, the audio sound collection at the BNF is at the crossroad of two uh, ways, two, two the old attitude and remnant attitude of enriching the collection, documenting treatment, conservation, and communication, but with, first, the priority of a cultural policy of mass diffusion, and second, the pressing needs of scientific research on sound recordings. That's why you have these new tools to work with that are accessible. And then, what is necessary for all that? I would say a strong structural organization of data following international codes based on resource description framework, a conceptual framework of a graph to describe the resources of the web and their metadata is the basic grammar of the semantic field, or the semantic web, excuse me, Linked data will then be possible. Interoperability of data demand the use of formats, technologies, and languages allowing site to communicate. Isolation is no more <laughs> the way now. We have to change our minds to play the to, to play the game that this technology allows us to play, and uh, and and not to be retracted, open access as, an, as a major diffusion process. And Gallica is a digital library of the BNF with 30,000 consultations per day. 
And uh, my, my collection of Philippine archive is already there. Since 95, I have deposit. Oh, excuse me. And then we are going next to uh, be able, in the next future, maybe next year, to put some excerpt of this enormous collection that is on the website on Gallica with the French translation. It will be more my personal work that will be there. Okay, so, um, yes, I will. I would like to show you next what is this, this expanding uh, web of data that is growing up. You can imagine what it is in 2015 beginning. Uh, and the UP Center of Ethnomusicology in, uh, in the University of the Philippines is the last thing I would like to mention. It is the collection there of Dr. Maceda is the most uh, precious one because he started in 53, passed away in 204 and stopped doing field work in 201. 200,000 hours, this is digitized among 68 linguistic groups. This is mainly music, but also epic are there. I have deposit, I was Nicole Revel MacDonald at that time, so it has this name. Kudaman is the first epic I was able to publish in 83, 1983. So this is full of uh, 68 groups. Huh? I have worked with epics of 15 only. So these are the publication we have done. This is the next, uh, uh, the Philippine, Palawan et music, and then the Kenya and Kayan and Modang uh, music in Kalimantan Timor. Then this is his major work on gongs and bamboo. It's an enormous book with distribution of then you were looking for books. I put them in, <laughs> in printing in, in scan way. This is my first epic, Kudaman, The Quest for a Wife, Mamu and Bean, is the second one, with this first with a flexible disc. Then the CD-ROM that is no longer in use, but retrieved by this uh, oral tradition as an e-companion and safe from oblivion by uh, recently. Uh, Literature of the Voice was a conference we had, and this is the song of an epic. It's a film I made out of my rushes about the life of a singer of Tell. He, sa première mise en intrigue, his first implotement of his own life. I said nothing. It's him speaking. I just back him with songs and photographs. Thank you. Thank you very much.